Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's talk at Google. I'm Cherise Torres. I'm a marketing director working on our corporate social responsibility programs, including environment. So this is an issue that's very near and dear to my heart. And I'm happy to be here to introduce you to Catherine Wilkinson. Catherine is the author of Project Drawdown. Uh, and I have a feeling most of you in the room and on the live stream are familiar with the book. But for those of you who aren't, let me give you a little bit of a, a synopsis, and then Catherine will walk you through more details. So the drawdown is the most comprehensive plan ever proposed uh, to reverse global warming. It was released on April 18th. It is the number one new release in climatology on Amazon and a top 10 New York Times nonfiction list. And it's the most tactical plan yet, describing 100 real life ways to address and reverse climate change. But enough from me. You didn't come to hear me speak. I'm going to pass it on to Catherine. And then we will go to question and answer. Catherine, it's all Thanks. you. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, all in the room and in the ether. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Sharice. I am excited to be with you all today to share a little bit about our work at Project Drawdown. Um, obviously, the 100 most significant solutions to climate change. We won't cover all of them, <laughs> but, but we'll go through some, some good content and then dive into to questions. So there's a basic story that we have been telling one another about climate change in recent decades, which is it's bad. It's going to get really bad. We are headed towards a potentially unlivable planet and ill-equipped as a species to change course. Please change your light bulbs and recycle your Coke cans and also cross your fingers that we'll have some silver bullet technology or policy solution that'll save the day. There are reasons for this story, um, but it tends to leave us feeling overwhelmed paralyzed, depressed, afraid, hopeless, right? None of these things, guilty, I should say, um, none of these things are good foundations for action when, of course, action is exactly what we need to be engaged in. And the individual actions that are sort of sent our way as suggestions, changing light bulbs and recycling Coke cans, feel just wildly out of step with the magnitude of the problem. So it really does sort of feel like, well, all you can do, you know, if you don't happen to be a utility company or a car manufacturer, is, is cross your fingers and, and hope. Um, there's also an underlying narrative, I think, here about human beings, which is that we are terrible, horrible, no good, very bad, greedy, lazy, incompetent, intransigent, and, and all the rest. Again, maybe there are some reasons for that, for that story, but it isn't the whole story. And the other side of the story is really what we try to bring to life in this book, Drawdown. Um, Drawdown is the product of a nonprofit uh, living research and communications project on climate solutions called Project Drawdown, which is actually just based in Sausalito. If you think about global warming as kind of the ultimate problem statement, for many years, our founder and executive director and, and editor of the book, Paul Hawken, really wrestled with a set of persistent questions in the face of problem, 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 which was, do we actually know what we're supposed to be doing? Do we have a list? Do we have a sense of apples to apples comparison of existing solutions, technologies and practices that we already know work, that are already proven, um, and then how much could they each contribute, right? If we scaled them vigorously but plausibly between now and, and mid-century, let's say, how much, how much of the needle can they each move um, when it comes to addressing global warming? So Paul being Paul, he sort of pitched this notion uh, to lots of different organizations and, and folks, all of whom said a list would be great. We're not in the business of doing that. And eventually, Project Drawdown was born to, to do the math and answer these questions. Um, and then ultimately, to bring the answers to life not in yet another dry and impenetrable and wonky climate report, but in a way that we hope is really accessible and instructive and maybe even inspiring um, for anyone, and, and not just for folks who sort of think of themselves as, as experts on climate. 
Drawdown is very much a global collaboration. These are um, photos of uh, research fellows. We had over 60 research fellows from six continents who worked on the project to date um, under the leadership of Chad Frischman, <coughs> our research director. Over 130 and growing um, advisors who are just incredible leading experts in various aspects of climate and climate action, again, with global representation, an absolutely wonderful board, and then a very small, <laughs> but what we think mighty staff. Um, so kind of imagine this whole community of, of folks behind this work. I promise this will be the only chart-ish slide. Um, this is a purely an illustration, but I wanted to talk about what's behind this name, Drawdown. To state the obvious, climate change is caused by a rising concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, right? We hit 402 parts per million of carbon dioxide last year and rising. Last time concentrations of carbon dioxide were this high, human beings weren't around. So we're, we're very much living in terra nova already. So for us, we use the term drawdown to refer to the point in time at which greenhouse gases could, hopefully will, peak and then begin to decline on a year-to-year -year basis. So you hear a lot in the climate space about slowing emissions or stopping emissions or stabilizing at a particular level. Um, and, and when Paul and our team stepped back and said, okay, if we're already living in Terra Nova at 402 parts per million, the idea of stabilizing there seems a bit wacky, right? Um, maybe, that's, maybe that's where we'll end up, but, um, but let's actually put forward a goal um, that is focused on that tipping point where we then head back towards con conditions that are most conducive for life on this planet. So that's, that's what Drawdown is about. What we found as we got into this work is that actually human beings have been hard at work developing a plan to achieve drawdown. We just didn't realize that that's what we were doing. So we've been out in backyards and schools, fields, forests, laboratories, companies, communities, testing, learning, refining, and then trying again. And along the way, as we've been dabbling in, in climate solutions, there's been an incredible body of data and peer-reviewed research that has been built up about, about these various technologies and practices. So our job at Project Drawdown wasn't to take a, a whiteboard and invent a plan. It was about going out and codifying the collective wisdom that already exists in humanity, the things that we already know how to do, and we understand why they work, why they don't work, what their economics are, et cetera, et cetera. And then to codify and synthesize that collective wisdom um, and then make projections, right, um, using that incredible body of material to understand how much can solution X, Y, or Z move the needle between now and 2050. Just the littlest bit more of, of kind of context setting Solutions are solutions because they do one or both of two things. So they either avoid sending greenhouse gases up into the atmosphere, whether that's through energy efficiency, replacing fossil fuels or other more polluting technologies with clean alternatives, reducing consumption, uh, pr protecting land and ecosystems, and or they bring carbon dioxide back home to Earth through turns out the ultimate carbon capture and sequestration technology of photosynthesis, right? The, the world has actually already really, really figured this out um, and, and bringing carbon back home and storing it in plants, soil, biomass. So we often tend to get into this trap of talking about carbon as bad, right? Carbon as, as evil, when actually carbon is a fundamental and vital building block of life. It's just a problem of what we've done with it, which is to say we've taken it from here and we've sent too much of it up there. So the issue really is about, is about balance more than anything. And then the solutions are organized into sectors. So energy, food, women and girls, buildings and cities, land use, transport, and materials. 
There are 80 solutions that fall into these sectors, and you can think of them as trains that have already left the station. So they are um, there are technologies and practices that we already see working. They're already growing. They're already scaling. Not everywhere, but they they are proven and they have potential to grow significantly and at a reasonable cost um, over the next 30 years. And then we have 20 coming attractions. So these are technologies or practices that are nascent. They're evolving. Maybe they're still very much in R&D. And even if they are being used effectively, we don't have this, the sufficient data from which to make the same kind of projections as we did for the other 80. So there's content in the book about these coming attractions, um, but no numbers tied to them. Um, nonetheless, we're likely to get some help from at least some of these coming attractions um, in the coming decades. So if anyone is a, sort of a betting type, this would be a good moment to jot down maybe what you think the top three sectors are. Um, if you have the book in your hand in this room, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> no cheating. <laughs> um, but this is sort of a, this is an interesting one. We certainly have lots of surprises on, on this. This is what a solution looks like. This is number 69 of 80, electric bikes. This is a bicycle mechanic in Berlin um, taking out his sort of latest e-bike model for a spin. You can see the combines pedals and also a motor. This portrait I just think is beautiful. This is a Dasnak woman, um, who, which is an ethnic group in Sudan and Ethiopia. She and other women in her village have started kind of gathering bottle caps, SIM cards, sort of the detritus of 21st century human civilization and making these beautiful headdresses and jewelry out of them. Um, this is the photograph that we used for household recycling, which comes in at number 55. Number nine is probably something that folks have not heard of. Um, I had not. It's silvipasture, which comes from the Latin words for forest and grazing. So conventional wisdom sort of tells us that trees and cows don't mix, but actually what we see is that the integration of livestock and trees can create incredibly resilient and symbiotic systems that benefit farmers because they have additional products that are coming to market at different timelines. They're better insulated from risk um, in the face of drought or extreme weather events. When it comes to climate, what's really powerful is that if you compare a pasture with trees to a pasture without trees, the pasture with trees sequesters five to 10 times more carbon than its treeless brethren. Um, so trees are, are kind of the secret sauce here. Um, and this turns out to have absolutely enormous potential. I'll just talk quickly about the numbers that you're seeing on these slides. So in the upper right, you've got the reduced CO2 emissions if this solution is scaled vigorously but plausibly between 2020 and 2050. If there are solutions, which there are, that address other greenhouse gases, nitrous oxide, methane, et cetera, then those impacts are translated into their equivalent in carbon dioxide. So we're able to have an apples to apples comparison and, and ranking of all of them. A gigaton, probably this is very evident in Google, mm -hmm. uh, a gigaton is a billion tons. Um, a cow weighs about a ton, so this is a pretty good um, visual for, for talking about this. So one gigaton is about a billion cows worth of carbon dioxide. For reference, we emitted about 36 gigatons uh, in 2016, so about 36 billion cows worth. Um, so you can see silvopasture comes in just a bit below uh, an, an annual year's emissions. That obviously drives the ranking. Um, in this case, number nine out of 80. And then in the bottom left, you've got the incremental cost to implement the solution. So what's the additional cost of purchasing an electric vehicle as opposed to a gasoline car, for example? And in the bottom right, the net operational savings, or in a handful of cases, cost, 
over 30 years. So again, what do you save from driving an electric vehicle as opposed to drive, driving a gasoline car? Or in the case of silvopasture, what's the additional revenue that a farmer gets from running a silvopasture operation as opposed to a regular pasture operation? This is the top 20. There are, I think, some really interesting insights and surprises and some things you'd expect and some really unsung heroes that end up landing in, in this list. So I thought we might just talk through what some of those things are um, and, and then we can, can kind of come back to other things if, if we don't cover them. The first thing that I think is a, a really powerful aha from this work is that food is eight of the top 20 solutions, and it's actually the largest sector overall in terms of its potential impact. Um, just, just a bit more than 320 gigatons of reduced carbon dioxide by mid-century. And what we include in that sector is what we produce, how we produce it, and then also reducing waste so that we don't have to produce so very much. And that's where I think maybe we should start. Um, reduced food waste, I think, is, is pretty compelling coming in at, at number three of 80. So about a third of the food that we produce around the world, and about 40% in the US, is not consumed. And that excess food that's then wasted um, generates about 8% of annual greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a really sizable chunk of the pie. In regions of high income, we have a tendency to waste by choice, right? So we overbuy, portions are huge, we forget about leftovers in the back of the fridge, consumers and retailers reject ugly produce, we have uh, best buy, sell by, consume by labels that actually, by and large, are totally disconnected from safety. So we throw perfectly good food away. Um, in regions of lower income, it tends to be a, a question of infrastructure and markets. So waste happens earlier in the, the food chain, if you will, um, and it has a tendency to be related to storage or um, labor, et cetera. What you see here in this photo are ugly potatoes and carrots that have been sent to the rubbish heap um, in England. We invest a lot of resources into food, whether we eat it or not, right? Uh, this is sort of stating the obvious, but seeds, water, energy, land, fertilizer, labor, capital, on and on. We harvest it, we process it, we ship it, we store it, we consume it, per, or we cook it, perhaps, don't consume it. Um, sometimes we end up cutting down forest to grow more food that we don't eat, and then oftentimes that food ends up in a landfill where it is potentially generating methane as it decomposes. So you've got all of these different dynamics of greenhouse gases getting generated through this kind of partial life cycle of, of food. Um, and that's what makes this such a huge opportunity. In France, um, pr pretty simple. They simply say it's illegal for grocery stores to throw food away. So guess what? It ends up in the hands um, of, of folks who need it and, and might not otherwise have it, or it ends up being shuttled into um, livestock operations to, to feed livestock. So lots of ways into impacting the solution, but I think what's um, really exciting about this one coming in at number three is that it's something we can all have an impact on immediately and at no cost, um, which I, I think is pretty exciting. And the same is true, actually, of solution number four. This is a, um, a, a painting some may recognize of Vertumnus, who is the Roman god of seasons and plant growth. Um, this solution is also completely free and in our control, and we can adopt it the second we walk out of the room, which is plant-rich diet. So coming in at about 66 gigatons, this is essentially doing the math on Michael Pollan's advice to eat food not too much, mostly plants, right? Um, raising livestock contributes about a fifth of our global emissions. Um, ruminants, cows, sheep, are the most prolific offenders because they have a rumen. They have a second stomach in which cellulose ferments and it creates methane. 
um, which mostly comes out as burps, contrary to, to popular opinion. Um, if cattle were their own nation, they would be the third largest emitter after China and the US. So this is no small problem. Um, some have probably seen in the last week the article that came out in the Atlantic and elsewhere that if Americans were simply to swap beans for beef, we could reach up to three quarters of our targets under the Paris Agreement by 2020. No technology required, right? This is, this is, this is powerful stuff. Um, of course, dietary change is hard. It's cultural and it's personal. Um, I'm from the South and nobody wants to give up barbecue, <laughs> right? Um, so we did not model here world becoming vegan. What we modeled here was protein, animal protein, and calorie consumption coming down in places like the US where it's much too high, and actually calories and protein going up in parts of the world where malnutrition is an issue. So this is more about the whole world coming into a healthier diet that ends up also, of course, having the benefits of um, lowering chronic disease and healthcare costs, et cetera. It also includes in this number the impact of avoided deforestation that would otherwise happen to grow more corn and soybean to feed more cows. Energy comes in with five of the top 20. It's the second largest sector overall. Um, and what I think is, is really fascinating here and worth pausing on is that energy has the tendency to just dominate our conversations about climate change. In large part, that's because energy has caused so very much of the problem. And it may continue to do so if we don't kind of get a grip on, on fossil fuel emissions. So changing energy sources and energy systems is absolutely critical. But we would be remiss to think that if we do that, we sort of have a hall pass into the 22nd century, right? Even if we get to 100% renewable energy, it cannot by itself solve global warming. So I, I think that's really important context. I love this photo so much. This is an Uru family that lives on Lake Titicaca. You can see just a little bit here. They live on a reed island. Um, and they've just gotten this solar panel, which means that they'll have electricity at their home for the first time. And the girls will not have to do their homework by kerosene lamp anymore. As you can imagine, kerosene lamps in a reed house on a reed island, right, is not a, is not a, great, a great recipe. So this is rooftop solar, which of course has incredible potential in higher income parts of the world. But as a form of distributed energy, it has incredible potential for the 1.1 billion people that don't have access to electricity or an electric grid. So, this is sort of one of those great examples where there are just layers and layers of positive co-benefits um, in these solutions, greenhouse gases just being one, um, one of those. This one's also, I think, really incredible. You see the potential savings in home energy costs over 30 years of almost $3.5 trillion. So um, again, another great example of where kind of economics are, are taking off um, and, and are really going to, to push forward the scaling of these solutions. Three of the top 20 solutions fall into what we call land use, so non-agricultural land use. And these are solutions that are focused on um, restoring, protecting, and harnessing the power of land and ecosystems for carbon sequestration. We're really just going through a lot of my personal favorites um, from the book. This, uh, anyone have a guess of what this might be? This is um, a harvested peatland. So peatlands are wetland ecosystems, we also call them bogs, mires, they are just 3% of the world's land area, but they're second only to oceans in the amount of carbon that they store. And they hold twice as much as all of the world's forests. Mm -hmm. So like, peatlands need some love, you know? <laughs> um, they are essentially made of layers and layers and layers and layers of decomposing plant material. So that's where you get all of the carbon. Um, if you left peat alone for long enough under the right conditions, it would become coal. 
when, when we were working on the book, it's like, how do we give peatlands like some sparkle and some magic? Um, it turns out that the Irish poet Seamus Heaney has written a bunch of, wrote, I guess, in the, in the 60s, some really fabulous poems about bog land in Ireland. Um, and he describes in, in one of these poems, the ground itself is kind black butter, which sort of then all of a sudden tells you everything you need to know about peatlands. Um, that kind black butter makes them under threat from farming and forestry and fire. Um, so what we've looked at here is the impact of expanding the acreage of protected peatlands. Again, we're not talking about a huge amount of land area, but it's a lot of bang for your buck in terms of protection. Um, and what's also on this slide that you haven't seen on others, um, this 1,230 gigatons, that would be the protected stock of carbon that the world's peatlands would then hold as of mid-century. Um, so a, a, another important um, piece of the puzzle. The, uh, the number one solution is refrigeration. Um, sort of deeply unsexy, I'm sorry to say. Uh, it focuses on chemical refrigerants in our, our AC systems, our refrigerators, our cold chains. Folks probably remember that in 1987, the Montreal Protocol um, began the phase out of, of chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, which were at that time the, the dominant chemical refrigerant that we used. Their primary replacement chemical, HFCs, great on the one hand because they have almost no negative impact on the ozone layer, but they turn out to be a thousand or, or more times uh, as powerful as carbon dioxide in terms of their global warming potential. So sort of solve one problem, end up contributing to another. Last year, the world came to an agreement to amend the Montreal Protocol. So the phase out of HFCs is going to be coming first in higher income countries and then in a, in a couple of subsequent waves. Scientists think that that move alone could reduce global warming by half a degree Celsius. So. This is no, no small thing. Um, and what we've looked at in this model is the potential to manage the HFCs that are already in circulation and that will come into circulation even as the world moves towards and through phase out. Um, so basically addressing leaks and managing what you do with these chemicals at the point of disposal, which is when about 90% of emissions occur. So really, really powerful. Um, Again, because of that high global warming potential, in terms of carbon equivalent, this comes in very high at almost 90 gigatons um, of avoided emissions. This is a section that has surprised a lot of folks. Women and girls, solutions number six and seven, educating girls and family planning. These are essentially solutions that focus on advancing women's rights and opportunity and well-being and then the positive ripple effects that come out of that in terms of, um, of, of the planet, of emissions, but also lots of other positive societal effects. So what we've looked at here is the impact of closing the gaps that exist in the world on access to education and access to voluntary family planning. So this is really a, a solution that begins and ends with rights, and then the emissions impacts are, are side effects. This is just another, I think, really beautiful photo. This is a, a young girl who is in school in Kenya, but 130 million girls around the world are not in school today, and that's especially a problem in secondary classrooms. Of course, education is an intrinsic right, and it feels very obvious to say, but it lays an absolutely vital foundation for our lives, right? Um, so what we see with more education is that women have higher wages and better upward mobility, um, maternal and infant mortality go down, rates of HIV, AIDS, and malaria go down, um, farms are more productive, they're less likely to be forced into marriage, on and on and on and on and on. Um, it also turns out that women who have more years of education choose to have fewer children, more actively engage in the use of contraception, and their children are healthier. So if you look at a woman who has no years of schooling compared to 12 years of schooling, the difference is four to five children per woman. I think it's really, really important to 
be clear that in the poorest countries in the world and in parts of the world where girls are having the hardest time getting educated, per capita greenhouse gas emissions are very, very low. They are a fraction of what they are in the US. Um, and in parts of the world that have done the most to cause the problem of global warming and have the most work to do to address it. So these absolutely have to be seen in the context of all of these other solutions. But still, when you're talking about changes in fertility rates, you're talking about a difference in the number of feet making their carbon footprints, right, as of, as of mid-century. And when you add that up, the cumulative effect is, is powerful. So what we've looked at here is the difference between hitting the UN's high population projection as opposed to its medium population projection. And, and, and that difference is essentially all comes down to, to family planning. Education and then contraception are, are two components um, that, that really add up um, to drive that impact. It also turns out that education is really powerful for shoring up resilience to climate impacts. So this is another one of the solutions that has kind of many, many, many layers of benefits. So for example, um, education is the number one factor for girls and women surviving natural disasters. So more education, you're less likely to be injured or displaced or killed when a storm hits. And that's obviously just one of the many impacts um, that's headed our way with climate change even as we work to address it. So if you add up educating girls and family planning, it turns out that actually empowering women and girls is the number one solution to global warming. Despite this being um, the era of BuzzFeed, <laughs> it is not actually about the number one or the top five or the top 10. Um, we need all of these solutions and we have all of these solutions. So, I just want to zip through a few more photos because they're just wonderful. Um, we can grow the acreage of protected forests like the Great Bear Rainforest in British Columbia, which is just an incredible success story on this front. This is a lovely, hungry Kermode bear eating salmon in the Great Bear Rainforest. We can build more offshore and onshore wind farms. This is the Sheringham Shoal wind farm, which is 88 turbines off the coast of Norfolk, England. And this is not photoshopped. <laughs> this is actually um, an athlete in training. We can install more green roofs and cool roofs. This one, I think, is particularly lovely overlooking uh, Basel, Switzerland. This is the roof of the hospital there. We can uh, spread a set of actually very simple practices for growing rice in a way that increases yields but also reduces methane production um, through the growing cycle of, life, of rice. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we will have some help from coming attractions. So this is one that we are already getting help from. I think we'll see the first high-rise wood building in Portland, Oregon. It's been permitted, and I think construction is, is, has started. Um, I just think this one is so fascinating. So there are now these high-performance wood products um, that are as strong and even more fire-resistant than steel and concrete, which I found just wild and shocking. Go read about this. It really is quite amazing. And they have the double benefit of sequestering carbon in that wood. So dry wood is about 50% carbon. So if you've, got, um, if you've got wood that's locked into the structure of a, of a building that's going to stand for a long time, that carbon is, is being held there. And also, you're able to avoid the emissions of, of steel and concrete, which are incredibly high. Combined, they're at least 10% of our annual emissions. So really, really amazing. This is just another. And now I'm just showing you guys like a couple cool ones <laughs> because I think they're fun. Um, we might be able to use marine permaculture arrays. So imagine sort of giant lattice-like structures from which we can grow floating kelp forests that have the benefit of um, sequestering carbon really quickly, but also creating habitat for fish and sea life in parts of the oceans where basically they're now sort of dead zones. Um, 
potentially producing food and fuel. There's a, a lot of exciting opportunity here. Maybe we will end up pursuing the proposal of a pair of father-son scientists in Siberia who are testing and advocating for repopulating the Arctic with herbivores, um, perhaps even recreated mammoths. <laughs> there are folks also working on this um, that could prevent permafrost from melting. Um, I, I'll, I'll let you read about that in the book because it's, it's quite fun. I think you can look at these 100 solutions and think, oh my gosh, we have so much to do. But you can also look at them, I think, and see, oh my gosh, there's so much we can do. There are literally so many ways into having an impact on this issue, so many footholds, and so many realms of agency for literally everyone, um, which I think is, is really, really exciting. The toolbox that we have is already is so, so, so rich. We started um, with this dominant story arc of doom and gloom, um, the one that tells us that human beings are terrible, horrible, no good, very bad. Um, when you come through this lens of solutions, the other side of the story, I think, becomes really clear, which is that human beings are also <coughs> creative and compassionate and collaborative and committed and every now and again brilliant and, and pretty gutsy. And I think if we want to stay courageous and driven in the face of climate change, which we need to do, and if we want to invite more people into this work, which we need to do, then I think we need to hear and tell and own this story, right? The doom and gloom at higher and higher volume and frequency is not exactly like a great pickup line. <laughs> um, and this is a true story, right? It's a story of what we are already doing what we can do, and I think also about who we are as human beings. The climate movement basically has been giving an I have a nightmare speech for the last 30 or 40 years. Um, it's a really easy speech to give, actually, when you look at the science of the problem and the timelines that we're on. Like, screaming I have a nightmare, really doable and, 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 and reasonable, um, but it's not working as a, as a strategy. Um, we need the clear and credible vision that's actually worth fighting for, right? What, what are we talking about beyond averting catastrophe? What's, what's the dream? Um, and I, I'm very, very hopeful that Drawdown begins to help articulate that vision, makes a contribution towards, towards that vision. For me personally, it's a vision that's grounded in honoring the sacredness of life, human and non-human life on this planet. Um, the solutions for reducing greenhouse gases are also a means of building a more resilient, more equitable, more prosperous, more vibrant world. Um, and I think when we get locked in talking about just emissions, we lose this bigger picture about what the world that we're trying to create actually, actually looks like. We already have the technical capacity to achieve drawdown. I think that's a really, really important takeaway from this book. So the question then for all of us, I think, is how do we cultivate the human capacity to get there? How do you stay in the work? How do you keep making change happen? We have at least 100 ways in, um, as this book shows, to moving the needle on global warming. So the question that I, I hope it poses for all of you is, which one will you pick? Who might you work with? Um, what talents might you deploy? There is such an incredible opportunity for impact um, and a role for every, everyone to play. The, the work to create this book and the ongoing work of keeping these models living and evolving and improving um, and keeping the communication living, evolving and improving um, is complex. But actually, I think the moral of the story is really, really simple, which is that it's not game over for climate change and global warming and the planet. It's actually game one. It's there. Thank you, Catherine. So we are going to move into a Q&A session. We have a couple of prepared questions, and then we're going to go to the Dory and to the audience. So if you give us one second, we're going to mosey on over here, and we're going to move the camera. So I'm vamping a little bit here. Work with me. Um, and, and if Catherine, anyone actually did take the bet, 
<coughs> you can see you can see how you did on the on the ah, ranking. Yeah. Fantastic. Cool. So I want to make sure to save a lot of time for Dory questions, and oh, I'm getting a little feedback uh, for Dory questions and for questions from the audience. So I'm just going to ask a couple um, from our prepared questions here, and. Uh, We've heard the science, and we've heard the background and what drew um, Project Drawdown together. Yeah. We'd love to hear a little bit more about your personal story. What yeah. drew you both to Drawdown in particular, but to climate change in general? In general. Um, so when I was 16, I lived in the woods for four months with 25 other high schoolers. We lived in one-room cabins in the woods and chopped wood to heat those cabins and worked in the garden. and. Um, there was a really heavy emphasis in that, uh, in that program called the Outdoor Academy in Western North Carolina on, on sustainability, on natural history, and environmental education. Um, it was when I also started sort of reading the work of important authors in this space. Basically, I became indoctrinated mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and kind of shifted from loving the outdoors to wanting to live and work in a way that, that helped us address these challenges that, that we're facing um, as, as a global community. I went on to pursue that in undergrad. Um, I worked for a, a big nonprofit out of undergrad um, and was really struck by the way in which the environmental movement, sitting mostly as it does in New York and San Francisco, um, sort of talks right past most of America. Mm -hmm. So I was spending a lot of time in kind of stereotypically like megachurch, NASCAR, country music mm -hmm. land. Um, and, and I just was, that gap between the environmental movement um, and most of America and people who really do care about land and place um, just really hit me. And, and I, so I, I really wanted to grapple with kind of other, other ways in. Um, and it turned out that that year, the Evangelical Climate Initiative launched, which was an effort by a large group of more moderate evangelical leaders um, to mobilize their community, which depending on how you do the math is quarter to a third of US population um, to, to address global warming. Um, I, I went on to do a PhD at Oxford trying to kind of understand and unpack that phenomenon. Where did this come from and how were they framing the issue and um, to what degree was it resonating or not with the church going public? Um, and after doing that work, I was like, I cannot work on climate change. <laughs> um, this is really depressing. Mm -hmm. and and. Finishing up grad school kind of coincided with um, what looked like our best opportunity in a generation to get federal climate legislation passed um, in the US, passed in the House, it didn't get through the Senate, and then there were sort of the dissolution of global talks in Copenhagen, and I just was like, this feels like banging one's head against a wall when sort of everything hinges on, on, on global agreements. Right um, or or what Washington can can agree on, um, so I sort of stepped back from it for a few years and then through a consulting project um, met Paul, our our founder, and immediately the the sort of ethos and perspective of Drawdown spoke to me both from my kind of academic background and my my sort of analysis of what I thought was missing in the climate movement and where it needed to be stronger, but also personally, mm -hmm. right? Like I had been really tugged at um, a sense of responsibility and possibility to, to come back into, into making an impact in, in this space. Um, and so kind of the, the combination of those two really just sang to me. So um, it's been fun to be, instead of sitting in an academic seat, kind of analyzing the stories that we tell mm -hmm. about the world and our relationship to it, to actually be embedded in this really amazing team that's doing the work to shape those stories. Awesome. Yeah. So you talked about um, a key legislative moment that was mm. part of your journey, and I think Everyone in here is probably thinking about, and our live stream is thinking about our current political climate and the impact on the environmental movement there. For the yeah. fact that you know the word climate change is systematically being removed from lots of uh, yeah. documents and papers. Would love to hear your thoughts about um, 
climate change in this current political environment? Yeah. Um, it does not feel good to be here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think everyone's hope was that the second Bush administration was going to be the worst that we saw mm -hmm. on this front and that we had, had hit a, a turning point. Obviously, that was wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there, so I want to be honest about the bad news, which is that given the science and given the timelines, we need every single part of society pulling its weight to address this issue. We're not going to get that from Washington. Um, but the good news is that actually, essentially all of the progress that's been made in this country on climate has been done in the absence of leadership in Washington, right? Even when you had the Obama administration pushing, they were getting thwarted and blocked, and a lot of those um, initiatives have just been caught up in, in court. So actually, the leaders on this, cities, states, businesses, communities, have been leading, they've been having an impact, and they're going to keep doing it. And what we saw with the announcement about the plan to pull out of the Paris Agreement um, was a doubling down, mm -hmm. right? Both from leaders in the US um, and also the rest of the world. And I think that was the fear. If the US pulls out, does, does everything crumble? Um, and basically, everyone said, yeah, no, we're, we're in. And we're actually like, you know, <laughs> add, 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 add on to on, onto that bet. So I think that's the great news. I think also we see some really hopeful news around the economics. So a report just recently came out um, that solar and wind will be the cheapest form of electricity generation in the world within three years. Mm -hmm. So they're already at parity or, or cheaper in some parts of the world, but um, that the, the cost declines that have come around solar and, and turbine technology have happened so much faster than anyone predicted. So I think we're starting to see some of um, the, these kind of wind at our back, I guess, um, of economics and you know, even probably a, a sort of half-baked businessman in the White House could, could figure out that those economics make sense. So you talked a little bit about um, how climate change has been positioned for individuals. It's about yeah. recycling and uh, electric cars or using an electric bike. Um, talk to us about the relative importance and different roles that individuals versus collective action have to play in this. Yeah. Um, I think it's been a real miss of the environmental movement to, to focus so much on individual action. Um, look, individual action matters. I, I think it matters more as a way to enact your values mm -hmm. um, as it does impact. Right. So I've been vegetarian since I was 16. But for me, that's partially a mechanism for reflecting on what it is that I care about and reflecting on my kind of ethic um, at least three meals a day. So I think these things matter, but collective action is really where the rubber hits the road. And, and that can be collective action in the form of of, of movements, right? You see really incredible work being done by Bill McKibben and 350.org, which is focused more on how do we keep fossil fuels in the ground, which is really important work. Um, Citizens Climate Lobby has built up a really incredible grassroots effort to, to try and cultivate that political will in every congressional district in the country. Um, so, you know, if, if sort of that's a, a place that you feel called to take action. I think that's a, a really great way, um, a great way in, but also through, through business and also mm -hmm. through neighborhoods. Um, but we're probably never going to see more than five or 10% of people like really care, right? And really take voluntary action. So the question is, you know, how do you shift structures and how do you shift bigger institutions and organizations um, to make change? And it, what we see from social movements is it doesn't take that many people to pull together into a collective voice to be able um, to, to move the needle. Awesome. So let's jump into some questions from the Dory. Uh, so first question we have is uh, corporations have a big responsibility for climate impact. Uh, are there good examples of corporations that have taken steps to align profitability with protecting the planet from climate change? Um, and what can consumers do to apply, consumers and Google do to apply additional influence and pressure mm. on that front? So I'm sort of geeked out that this would be an example I wanted to talk to you about. Um, and you have their carpet in this room. 
Um, so this is a company called Interface that um, has really been, they're, they're, a, they're a public company, but they're smallish. Um, they're headquartered in Georgia. And they have been an absolute vanguard and pioneer in sustainability on business. Mm -hmm. um, their founder and, and CEO, late founder and CEO, actually read one of Paul's earlier books, uh, The Ecology of Commerce, in the mid-90s and had this sort of revelation of like, we have been raping and pillaging the planet and someday titans of industry who've acted like me are going to go to jail. Mm -hmm. And he set Interface on a course. They had no idea how they would do it. It's a petrochemical-based carpet manufacturing company to get to zero environmental footprint by 2020. It's, it's been an amazing journey. And now you see companies like Unilever saying, we're able to do what we're doing because Interface opened up the space to do this and showed the example that you can improve financial performance at the same time as you're dramatically shifting your environmental performance. Um, so 2020 aspiration of zero, mission zero, has been their focus. And they now have asked, what does it look like to go beyond zero to actually net good, net planetary good as a company? Um, so they have launched what they're calling carbon, uh, excuse me, climate take back as their, their kind of next corporate mission, which is how do we actually engage in this process of pulling carbon back down out of the atmosphere? How do, how do we do drawdown as a company where we're um, pulling more greenhouse gases down than we're sending up? Um, again, it's a, it's a big and bold mission, and they don't know how they will get there. Um, sequestering carbon in their products is probably something. They're already working um, with Janine Benyus and brilliant biomimicry team around how do you design a factory like a forest mm -hmm. so that it actually exhales net good into the world. I, I think these are the kinds of like really big questions we should ask. Lots of companies now are doing good stuff on kind of efficient operations. Um, but how do you really take that next big, bold, pioneering step, I think, is, is the question. Awesome. So our next question from the Dory, and I'll, I'll go to the audience in, in one minute, um, talks about how you gave lots of examples of how to reduce the acceleration of temperature change around the world. Mm -hmm. The question is, are there are there folks out there, researchers, nonprofits, grassroots groups, grassroots groups that are forming strategies around this, and how can Googlers contribute? And I will mm -hmm. interrupt once so I can say one way Googlers can contribute is actually by donating to Project Drawdown. So if you are on the live stream, you can actually go to go slash drawdown hyphen donate to make a donation. And if you're in the room here today, when you go in the back of the room to pick up your book, we have a badge reader where you can make a donation right from um, a payroll deduction. So it's super easy. And Project Drawdown is the group behind this book. Yeah. So that's one way. Are there some other folks you can point to around, you know, they're doing really great work here and we should look into doing more work with them? Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. We are a very small organization. So donations really do have a, a big impact for us. Um, there are so many organizations doing good work. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that is the really exciting thing. And obviously, we could only include a smattering of examples in this book. Um, what I hope that people will do is, is, is use the book as like a choose your own adventure, right? So clearly, all of these things have impact. All of these solutions have impact. The need is really clear. So then the question is like, what is it that stokes a fire in your belly? Right? What's a way that you want to contribute? Is it with time, talent, resources? Um, and kind of think about that intersection. Um, the theologian Frederick Buechner called it, where your deep gladness meets the world's deep need. Um, yeah. So you know, or if you don't know, like flip through the pages and, and pick one. I mean, there really are there are organizations working on on all of these. That's why they're all growing and scaling already. And and so I think if you sort of focus on an area, um, then it becomes, OK, well, yeah, I, I actually really care about family planning. What are the organizations that are doing good work on this? Or you know, are there, are there startups advancing cool things in this area? <coughs> um, is community X you know, doing something really powerful that we could replicate here? Um, those are the kinds of questions I would ask. I hate to be too prescriptive. Sure. Um, but also, keep an eye on our website, because 
as you can imagine, since the book came out, we've had lots of folks flooding in with desires for partnerships and collaboration. I think actually there are some conversations going on with X. Um, and, and so we're sort of putting together what that architecture of, of collective impact and, and different working groups across different areas um, may look like. So tons of ways to plug in. Awesome. Yeah. Any questions in the room today? Yeah, say your question, I can repeat. Oh, we have a microphone, even better. <laughs> Uh, first of all, thank you for coming here. This was very inspiring. Um, so one of the texts about global warming that I've read that really concerns me is Bill McKibben's uh, Three Numbers of Global Warming. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but for people who aren't, basically he talks about three numbers. The first one is two degrees Celsius is like the consensus that scientists have agreed that the temperatures can rise without like horrific consequences. Um, then like 500 and something gigatons of carbon dioxide is how much carbon dioxide that equivalates to. And then the last number, which is when I just got really terrified, is that I think 200 or 2,500, so five times larger than the 500 that we can emit for two Celsius. So 2,500 is how much is already planned in the economy to be emitted in, I don't know how many next years. So yeah. it's already in companies' shares. It's already um, people are going out and like, um, like it's oil that's already being pulled out from the ground. So I guess coming down to the question is, um, do you think, like what, what are your thoughts on that? And do you think we may have reached a point where even if we start doing a bunch of actions, it might be too late? Mm. So, so I don't have a, a crystal ball. So I don't know how this is going to go. Um, the way I think about it is we don't have any option other than to go really hard at solving the problem, right? Like, if you say, well, game over, then what, you, you're gonna just give up on humanity? You know, like, what, what do you do with that? And, and what I appreciate um, from, from Bill McKibben and, and his work, right, is like, what this has done for Bill is like, he is on the front lines um, of, of trying to keep fossil fuels in the ground. Um, for me, if I only think about those numbers of, Here's how much more we can emit before we really turn this planet into a disaster zone. Um, and here's how much we're planning on emitting. And, and even worse than that, here's how much we could emit, right, if we, if we really went for all of these fossil fuel resources. Like, that's terrifying. And for me, that place of, of terror, like, leaves me feeling really frozen and paralyzed. Um, and, in, and I think it's an important part of the story to understand um, and if you only read that chapter, like you're, I think you miss, you miss the bigger picture. Um, Bill wrote a really great article in Rolling Stone a few years ago called Global Warming's Terrifying New Math, which like is exact, I mean, it is just totally terrifying. Um, and, and I think we, I think we need to be honest with ourselves about the potential of what's ahead um, but I think we have to be really thoughtful about the rest of the conversation that we're, we're building in with that. So there was also a very doom and gloomy piece just recently in, um, in New York Magazine, which my feeling is like, yeah, if you're gonna do doom and gloom, like do it like that, like just rip the Band-Aid off, you know, and just tell people, it's like, this is, you know, this is how bad it could be. Um, but what I didn't, like about that piece was at the end of it, he says, yeah, but all these scientists still have hope. And they have hope because maybe there'll be a carbon tax and maybe we'll have some geoengineering solutions. And to me, like I don't have faith in either of those necessarily. I do have a lot of faith in the things we're already doing that are already working and our ability to scale those things. Like maybe we'll get some extra help, um, but, but I don't think that's where we should hang our hat. So, um, these are my thoughts. This is, we were talking about this at lunch actually. There's an amazing um, Quaker thought leader named Parker Palmer who talks about the tragic gap and the work of staying in the tragic gap, which is the space between the world as it is and the world as it could be or should be. Um, and it's really easy to flip out into cynicism on the one side, or it's really easy to flip out into you know, kind of starry-eyed optimism, like, gee whiz, like, you know, everything's always getting better. Um, 
and that there's work to stay in the work. Um, and, and I think that looks different for different people. Um, but if I only thought about those numbers, I would only stay in tragedy and, and cynicism. Um, and I don't think I'd be able to keep doing the work. And I think on that point, we're at 2 o'clock, and it's a great place to end. So let's keep on in the gap doing the work, because through our actions and collective actions, more importantly, we can make a change. So Catherine, yeah. thank you so much for coming. My thank pleasure. you all for attending and dialing in. Thanks. Thank you so much.